of civil environmental engineering are those two images that you see on the front. Okay? Buildings and bridges. B and B Club. <laughs> okay? I'm hoping to change that. First, we're going to talk a little bit about the history of engineering and where civil environmental engineering comes from. Uh, initially, it was military engineers and civilian engineers. <laughs> So the civilian engineers were the ones who did buildings and roads and aqueducts, not trains. <laughs> That's another one that got stolen. No, okay. So <laughs> military engineers worked on the weaponry and, and, and the battlements, okay? Then we had the scientific revolution, industrial revolution. Yes, I know I'm skipping through history very quickly. <laughs> and we got to where we are, sort of where we are today. And I, I really think this is not where we are today. This is just the beginning of the engineering field really was in the 1800s, late 1800s, early 1900s. And Tufts University actually mirrors this. We initially started giving a civil and environmental engineering, really just a civil engineering program in 1865. It's one of the earliest programs that were provided around the country. Okay? From that became a degree program. From that grew a college that had four different departments, a mechanical engineering department, a chemical engineering department, and an electrical engineering department, along with the civil engineering department. What has since grown is, is that, well, we actually have a biomedical engineer. Electrical has turned from electrical to electrical and computer engineering. And civil has gone from civil to civil and environmental. Okay? There's also computer science, which if, this is, this, this may be a surprise, but it tufts the number one major it's not international relations, it's not economics, it's computer science. Mm -hmm. It's been a complete switch in the last five years as to where computer science, and computer science is actually housed within the School of Engineering. So it's an interesting place. But that history is, is really key to me, and I, I'm going to come back to that word civil. You can tell that it's going to be a, a major point that I'm going to talk about. So in terms of getting a civil engineering degree, if anyone here have engineering or work with engineers on a regular basis, I'm just curious, do you know what rigorous program they go through as an undergraduate it's just to get their first entry level degree in, in civil engineering? It is typically 35 to 40 courses over a four year period. That's why many of them take five. Some take six. Some don't. <laughs> this doesn't happen. <laughs> It's set up through introductory courses, mostly in the math and sciences. There are courses in engineering that, in math and sciences, that do not qualify for credit. They're too simple, too. Okay, so it's one of the things you have to do. The computing often enters into that set of introductory courses. By the second year, you get what are called engineering science courses. This is statics, basically dealing with forces and, and movement dynamics as well. Fluids, air, water. Okay, those fluids. Statistics as well. Management enters into that as well. Project management and management skills. Technical writing, things like that. They enter into this as well. Okay? By this point, everyone's sitting there as a student going, where's the engineer? <laughs> I've been doing this for a year and a half, maybe two years, I haven't seen anything yet. Okay? And then, wham! We hit them with a major concentration. Okay? Major concentration, generally about 12 courses in most engineering disciplines. Uh, you focus on two or more of the sub-disciplines in civil and environmental engineering at Tufts, okay? And it's pretty common elsewhere that you may have to do three of these sub-disciplines, okay? At Tufts, we only offer four. Here are the eight. Here's the guessing game. Get ready. I want you to guess which of the four, which of these eight, four of the eight that we do. So there's materials, there's transportation, there's geomatics, which is surveying in essence, construction, geotechnical, water resources, environmental, and structural. Can anyone tell me the which four? Environmental. Water okay. resources. Structural. Structural and both of them, water resources. I heard that one. And, and, and? Construction. Materials. Construction. Geotech. Transportation. Geotech. Geotech. Okay. <laughs> it's like everybody just throwing out me. We'll get there. All right? The easy part is get rid of the first four, and that's what we don't teach. <laughs> okay? And it's not that we don't talk about them. It's not that they're not connected to what we do. It's just that in terms of what we specifically work on and, and have as areas that we say students can actually work through, it's geotechnical, water resources, environmental, and structural. Okay. All right, so that's the degree program. 
Okay? The question that always comes back around is, what happens to the rest of the degree? Okay? We do humanities, arts, and social science, often called HASS, H-A-S-S. It rounds out the degree. I put that in quotes on purpose because many engineers, and I say engineering faculty, but I'm saying even engineers, they feel like, okay, this is just extra stuff I got to do. And it's not truly central to what they should be doing. Okay? And I'm in the other side of that. I actually believe that you can make this simple. The other stuff is important. You can't be an engineer without it. You gotta have that technical know-how, you gotta have that math, that science, all that stuff. You gotta be there. But I also think there's an important piece that many of our engineering students are not gathering to miss. Civil engineering, it's a whole lot more than bridges. This is why I'm gonna to try to break you up today. We do things look at hazardous mapping. Okay? So we, we look at what, what happened if an earthquake happens. We get a little more into that. Sensor network. Biomechanics, that is part of civil and environmental engineering. Okay. And I'll try to go through that a little bit in the next, next few slides and then open it up a little bit. Go back to those four areas that I've talked about. Geotechnical, often combined with geo-environmental. What they basically came to recognize is that geotechnical engineering is basically anything beneath the ground surface. Okay. Geo-environmental means anything that's environmentally concerning <coughs> underneath the ground surface. Okay. So, that's a classic geotechnical engineering problem right there. I've got to excavate a, uh, the foundation space, or basically a new building can we go in this hole. But I've got to get down to where I can actually have underground parking and therefore charge people tons of money. <laughs> okay. But that's a lot of work to make that happen. That's geotechnical engineering if working through that process. Okay? But geotechnical engineering also looks at just the dam. And this is going to be interesting because dams actually enter into another one. We'll see this happening often. Uh, we look at the geotechnical issues associated with this dam. How did it get built and why is it built there? And how do you actually interact that dam with the subsurface that it's resting on? Okay. I like to say geotechnical engineering is a requirement for all civil engineers because until we actually make more space labs, most of the things we build are sitting on the ground. <laughs> <laughs> so they have to know that. Earthquake engineering is a special component of Geotechnical engineering that has a strong impact, very broad impact. This is just looking at uh, an earthquake that happened in, in Kobe, Japan in 1995, so it's rather old data. And we're trying to figure out well, what areas liquefied, in other words, what areas of the ground actually shook and actually collapsed, so buildings collapsed, all these things collapsed. Okay, and the reason why, it may be because of what was beneath those buildings, what type of soil was there. And so we actually evaluate what happens when the ground is shaken, what happens with those soils. And it depends on how violently it's shaken and how much water is there and how loose the soil is. A lot of things enter into that. So that's doing part of earthquake engineering. But we also look at, okay, based on what we know the soils are, if an earthquake happens, what could get damaged? And that's hazard mapping, okay? So here's a hazard map that was developed for COVID in Japan. All right. Water resources. Okay, this is the simple hydrologic cycle. Okay, and it is a circle, yeah, okay. It, it rains from the sky or some sort of precipitation that actually falls on the earth. It probably runs down. So it's got runoff in rivers and streams. We've got some water that actually just runs on the surface. It just wants to get to the river as fast as it can or get to the lake as fast as it can. So it gets to this open water body and then it evaporates from the open water body. But sometimes it transpires from the plants. So transpiration goes back into the air. Okay. Circle, keeps going. Some of it also gets thrown into the groundwater, okay? The groundwater will go back into the river or into the lake, and again, the process continues, okay? That's science, environmental science, for the most part. But it makes a strong connection, okay, to what you want to do as an engineer, say, how can I harness that? So something like a dam is actually trying to harness that. So here I've got water behind a dam, okay, I'm running that water through the dam to actually generate electricity. So this is how the Hoover Dam actually works, and many hydrologic dams. Okay. Sadly, not all dams are generators, and them are just there to block the water. Okay. When you block the water, you change two things. All the things upstream now will see more water. Some, some will actually go underneath the water, so you can lose things on the other side. The biodiversity, all kinds of things. But also on the downside of the dam, 
Okay, downstream, you're stopping the water flow from what it was before. So you're changing that as well. So building this dam, really a lot of mechanical pieces, okay, and definitely some civil engineering components, but the impact that it has is much greater. And it starts moving and you look at other disciplines if you're in this, the mood of studying it, but also from just a connection to the way that we live, you start to see what it does as well. Okay. So that's water resources. Let me jump into structural engineering. It's one that most people recognize, you know, the building and the bridges. Okay. This is a very simple one. We had some students going out and testing pieces of the old central artery. And those of you that may not remember, the big dig was not underground. <laughs> the big dig used to be above ground, and that was called the central artery. Went through Boston. Nice, lovely pictures of it. This exactly you see it. This snake ran right through and split the city into two pieces. Architecturally, it didn't look all that great. Really, it physically separated the city. Okay, so by getting rid of it, getting rid of that ribbon of highway coming through the city, you actually changed the way the highway, I'm oh, sorry, the way that area now interacts. Okay, so it has some social benefit to put that big dig in. In this case, our students went out to actually test some of the underpinning, basically some of the ways in which they were using the old artery and the new artery to find out what's going on with the behavior of the soil beneath, of the foundations that they were using. Truly highly high level structural engineering effort, okay? For structural engineering, especially mechanics, it's a little bit further, okay? I can do things such as what happens when I take a bridge, and in this case, this is the uh, walkway bridge at Tufts University and from Dowling Hall onto the rest of the campus. So there's a very nice uh, walkway bridge. It's been evaluated as to what happens when that bridge gets shaken, okay? And I'll do it the simple way. We got sensors on the upper part of this image that are collecting information. So here's a sensor located underneath the bridge. The bridge was excited, which means it actually got uh, punched, so to speak. But there was a load, a source that was put in. And measurements were made in terms of the displacements that happened. Now, the blue is OK. That means I got compressed. And the red means I got tensile. That means I actually got stretched. Okay? In terms of what, what happened to the bridge. But we can do this under different loading and come up with what we call different modes of response. So I got mode one, three, and five. And what happens is these I'm getting more things happening. I'm getting twisting now, not just this, uh, this lovely roller coaster, but now I've got twisting roller coaster, and then I'm going to really make it interesting and make some different dips in the roller coaster. Okay? All of that can be evaluated through civil engineering efforts, construction engineering. Again, very not classic engine, uh, structural engineering, but what <coughs> structural engineers can do. Okay. An interesting side when you get into biomechanics. Okay. So here, we're looking at biaxial testing, making large deformation materials. So your rubber band is a large deformation material. It can be stretched a long distance, and it can be let go, and it actually comes back. Okay. Would you believe that your aortic artery is similar? <laughs> <laughs> So if I'm looking at how things stretch and how, if I twist them, I can actually twist them with this lovely machine. What happens to it? The stresses and the strains of the stretching and the, the, the force, how it behaves under these loadings, okay? I can use those same things to look at what happens in the aortic artery under the abdominal aortic aneurysm, where the artery actually expands like a balloon, okay? We try to prevent it from bursting but the fact is it's sort of like a rubber band it's sort of like the mechanical material so I can evaluate what happens when this artery continues to be stretched and pulled just taking the structural engineering stuff that we have and applying it in a different area so biomechanics all right here we go if I can do this Environmental engineering, and it's got a lot of different facets associated with it. I'm just going to show you this very pretty, pretty picture, <laughs> if you will. The red stuff there is contaminants and a sand material. The stuff you see in blue coming across is trying to remove that red contaminant and leave the white sand in place. Okay? And you can see that it's doing it. It's now been going for half a day. Most of that red is gone. And by the end, it's pretty much all gone. 
significant amount of research goes into understanding that behavior. You have to look at the surfactant. When I say that word, does anyone know what surfactant is? We yes, so. use it a lot. So, yeah, so, so but I try to <laughs> something that lowers. Yeah. So Dawn dishwashing so. liquid is a classic surfactant because what it does, it actually is it you know it removes grease, right? Holds on the grease. Or surfactant does that. It actually is a molecule that actually will surround the grease molecule and say you're not going anywhere. I got it. <laughs> About as basic science as I can. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And so surfactants will do that. They'll take something like this, which was uh, uh, trichloroethylene, it's a chemical compound, a very nasty contaminant, and they will come in and take it. And when they take it, that means it no longer can interact with the rest of the environment. And so this was using surfactants to enhance the recovery, the removal of the trichloroethylene in the process. And so they had to wave it through. And so they're trying to figure out, make sure that the way that this is done is, is one, good, chemically good, but also just physically. Does it actually remove it? There are nooks and crannies in all types of soils. This is an interesting thing to try to figure out. So here's a nice little sand column to show this works. Well, let me put that in real life. Sorry, the world is not made of sand. It's got clay, it's got silts, it's got rocks, it's got all kinds of things. All right. All right. Environmental engineering, though, is a broad topic. I mean, it's really across different scales, different sizes. So here's the classic scale that everyone can actually visualize. This is uh, in Southeast Asia or Pacific Islands. I forgot the exact location. This is the canal. And this is the plastics that are there. You can see those that are along the side harvesting the plastics in many respects. Okay, but that's like water. It ends up in the drinking supply. It ends up in all kinds of situations. You can imagine what the environmental issues are here. The waste is going in. Waste generation, waste recycling in general is an environmental issue. Okay? That's large scale. That's really large scale. This little guy is cholera. Okay? Cholera is one of these diseases that can actually be treated as well as prevented. Okay. But it's triggered by many different things. And in fact, when they had the earthquake in Haiti, they had a cholera outbreak that quickly spread along the river that existed in Haiti. See? And they found that it was actually brought over. Introduced by aid workers. Yes, right. Introduced by aid workers. Not created because of the earthquake itself, but by the aid workers who came. They actually brought, put it into the system, and the system was registered. So how do, as engineers, you work with treating and preventing, with the most likely preventing these types of problems? Those four different areas, along with the other four, really provide a, a, a basis for someone who wants to study civil and environmental engineering, but it's not the, not the way in which it, in engineers can apply their work. In other words, some engineers do build bridges, and they focus on bridges, and they are very focused on bridges, but they also understand that bridges got to sit on the ground. So I can do some geotechnical engineering. Some bridges have got to bridge over water. So I got to understand water resources and about how water flows. Okay. Some just sit over land, gullies, whatever. Okay. Well, here's, here's a situation where it really does get multiple complex. And it's not that far away. So it's New Bedford. <laughs> and it's a marine commerce terminal. Anyone know what that is? Where all the boats go, for, for <laughs> in, in New Bedford, it's their harbor. Okay. The rationale for this project, and I'll go through what, what it is, is that when it's complete, it's, on, it's pretty much there. Uh, it will be the location to where wind turbines will be constructed before they get taken out of the sea. Okay. So they needed to build the facilities within the harbor, both the ability of boats to enter in and out that will have very deep draws, okay? But also the facilities that can actually handle the large pieces that will be coming in. A wind turbine is not 10 feet long. <laughs> it's hundreds of feet long and weighs significant pounds. Okay? And while research continues into how to make them lighter and longer, it turns out, um, 
it's still going to be very much oh, an issue of kind of handling these guys. Okay? So here are some of the problems that we ran into for this particular project. Um, and we're lucky enough that in Tufts we have a professor of practice who actually worked as basically the lead engineer on this, and he just brought it in to the classroom. So yeah, students actually work on this. But they had to look at the subsurface materials that were there and wonder structurally and geotechnically, can that material hold what was necessary? Can it hold the docks that they needed to build? Can it hold the retaining walls that they wanted to put in place? Okay. Could it be actually excavated and excavated nicely without causing any other issues within the harbor? Okay. But the harbor has a long history. It's one of the oldest, if not the oldest, harbor in the United States for fishing purposes, commercial fishing. So a use that is there, and a lot of it involves some hydrocarbons, <laughs> gasoline, things of that nature, coal tar is also present there. They have some environmental concerns. Not just with what was on the surface of the harbor, if you will, but also in the sediments associated with it. So they're environmental implications. Okay? And all of this required that nasty thing that engineers hate to do. Mm -hmm. They hate to the talk. <laughs> 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 there are some of us that uh, this is fine, you know, I, I'm a professor, I should be talking a lot. I can't just stand in front of class and put up a formula and say, end of the day. <laughs> I'm gone. <laughs> Doesn't work. But the communications is something that's very critical. Okay? So communication to private and public audiences was very important on what things were happening, what stages and when they would be happening, and what it would involve. Because this harbor, go back one, okay, it's sitting in the community. So now I'm gonna dredge all this material. How are you gonna get it out of there? You gonna drive it through the community? <laughs> if you do, what do you gotta do about driving it through that community? How are you going to protect it? And then how are you going to communicate that to that community? Okay. And that harbor's there. There are existing facilities there. Docks, restaurants, part of the, if you will, uh, ambiance of New Bedford. Okay. What is this construction work going to do to those existing things? Okay. So that's part of the communication side. All right. So, what this does is basically tells me that engineering is a little different, especially civil environment. Because our problems are global in many respects. Um, one is the infrastructure. Okay? And hopefully we'll hear that in this lovely campaign season, but it's been around for a number of years. Uh, the development and the repair or basically maintenance of that is, 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 is that you, infrastructure is not ubiquitous. It's not everywhere. We don't have the same infrastructure system that you see here if you were to go in Boston. It's a different infrastructure, okay? But the reality is, is that for most of it, especially in those well-developed areas in the United States, East Coast, big cities, it's not in good health, okay? And the American Society of Civil Engineering actually has created it as a B plus across the United States. So it's not a great shape. We also have to look at energy. The resources that we have available to us and our consumption of it. Okay. How efficient is that consumption? Okay. So it's another component that enters into our problem statement. Okay. We also have to look at waste generation. We seem to be in this forever increasing mode. Uh, I, I used to love to say, well, you know, every day each one of you develop four pounds of waste. Yeah. Know that? Really? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Not you personally. We just take all the waste that's generated and average it out on total people in the United States. But there's things such as burning the coal that we use for energy generation. It leads to a waste product. Millions of tons per year. I love to say we have 400 pounds of coal, of coal ash on our backs every year. That's how much we generate in the United States. Okay. And just so you know, China generates 10 times more than we do. So it's like it's forever generated. It seems to be there. And recycling. Great idea. Uh, I'm looking for the other guy recycling. Oh, no, I see a trash. Right. If you see the recycling bins, it's like great. If, here's a dirty little secret. Not all recycled material reused again. Okay. 
Sometimes it is actually thrown in with the trash. Because it's been contaminated with some other types of plastic, because you gotta keep the plastic separate. We just throw them all in one bin. But we take out the stuff we can easily get. I can see a milk jug. Yes, I know what that is. Okay? But I don't want that Dawn dishwashing liquid bottle with this one. Because it's contaminated with extra Dawn. Those things enter into the recycling process. So is recycling the answer? And then finally, human capital and capacity. Our population on this planet is increasing. We only have one. Yet we continually build it. So it enters into your mind as a civil and environmental engineer. What do we do about all this? A lot that should be thought about. And it goes far beyond just your technical knowledge. Okay? Yet your technical knowledge is an important aspect. Okay? So being an engineer, but also I think in solving all these problems. Okay? So what happened uh, about 10 years ago, maybe even longer, but I think 10 years ago, the grand challenges for engineering came out. Uh, this was something done by the National Academy <coughs> of Engineers. And what they came up with was a full list of 14. Here are four that I can just throw up, if you will. Okay? But there are 14 of these grand challenges. Four that really resonate with a civil and environmental engineer were in these areas. In terms of energy, uh, advancing fusion, maybe. Carbon and nitrogen cycle. There is a carbon cycle, just like there is a hydrologic cycle, there's also a cycle for carbon, how it gets used and reused again and again and again. Matter is the same, doesn't move. Can't expand it again. Okay. Nitrogen as well, another cycle, nice and true. Solar and other energy sources that are renewable. Wind, hydro, other forms. A second one was water. And it really, did, it really does deal with these three things. Quality of the water, the water that we drink, the water that we have like, accessible to. Uh, I, this entire semester, I just kept saying Flint, Michigan, and it's been quiet. That's all I need to say. That's a, pro that's a quality issue. The supply that we have, okay, where are we going to get water in the future? Some of our water sources are one running out or, okay, or won't be enough. So where do we get more water? Okay. And then the access side. There are those who have access and those who don't. Okay. The great uh, Wild Wild West in the 1880s in the United States would go behind that access. This is for my cattle. No, this is for my cattle. <laughs> Right now in California, access is huge. Okay. Who gets that access? Infrastructure. Okay. We got to worry about the materials that we use, how we monitor these networks to see how well they work. Uh, there's a lot of health monitoring. They call it structural health monitoring that we've done. But basically, you can search your computer and see how this bridge sits on such and such street. And that's what we these are things that you can start to see civil and environmental engineers start to plug themselves into. Beyond their traditional knowledge of knowing what structural is and knowing what geotechnical is and stuff, they start to see that they actually are impacting society, impacting life. And one of the things that basically made me realize is, is that I gotta reconcile this disconnect that we have between knowing all this stuff from a knowledge standpoint and how do we make humankind better? And how do we enhance our position on this planet? So in doing that, I realized that we have a lot of screens. Yeah, we are intelligent. Okay. We are also quite flexible, adaptable to our environments. And you got to think about it. We have people living up around the Arctic Circle and some around the equator. And we can travel between the two. I'm saying it's pretty adaptable just from a weather standpoint. Okay. We have those that live in the city and those that live country. We also need to recognize our limitations and our constraints. Again, we only have one planet to work with. It is large. It has a lot of resources. I'm not going to deny that at all. But we do have to worry about expending it too fast, too much. Okay? There is this one piece that we should recognize. The Earth is, it regenerates. It actually heals itself in many respects. It regenerates itself. It'll grow new trees. Okay. But it can do some regeneration. There's a limit, 
limitation of its regeneration. Okay? And those things probably should be recognized. So what this really requires is a more holistic approach. A way to view engineering as just one component of how we should go about doing our this. Okay? So, it leads to an alternative design methodology. All right, so I think it's important that we apply a systems approach to design. Okay? We have to recognize there is a big inter interdependence between all the different facets that we're going to run into in life. Okay? Sometimes we do some creations that have unintended consequences. Therefore, we need to actually go beyond that point of saying, hey, I just created this lovely, nice wastewater treatment facility. Oh, I know it produces a waste on the side, but we can handle that. No, we can't handle it sometimes. Sometimes we can, but we're still creating a waste. So we have to think about our unintended consequences from that. We also need to include the economic, political, social, cultural issues in our designs. We should make those explicit components of what we do in design. So just as I know the bridge and I want to make sure that I basically specify the right size column and the right size beam and the right size thickness slab, I also got to think about where, where's this bridge going and what is it connecting and is it really necessary to do? And if I do this bridge, what's the consequences of this bridge? Am I connecting two sides that actually can have a benefit okay, to each other? Or will they totally ignore it and then for the bridge it's just no one driving over? interesting things to think about. In order to do this, you have to work in multidisciplinary teams. And I'm not saying you have to work in a structural engineer with a geotech engineer team. <laughs> I'm really talking about, no, you've got to have engineers working with humanists, working with social scientists. Okay. Truly expanding what is a design team. Okay. And explore these things in this very broad, broad way. Okay. One thing that I accuse engineers of is that we tend to think that if we develop one design, we can take that design and put it somewhere else and put it somewhere else. Um, there was a house builder in, uh, in New England, his name was Capaletti. Uh, he built houses in the 1950s. Um, I swear what he did was he took the plan. Okay, flip the plan over. Okay, that's the next house. <laughs> Turn it this way. That's the next house. <laughs> it was very interesting. I lived. I now have lived in two neighborhoods in, Mass in Massachusetts, and both of them in that same design. The houses, that the, I know where my neighbor's bathrooms are. <laughs> <laughs> it's that clear to me, because it's like, okay, yeah, you're going to take back here. It's like the same house plan. So it's an interesting concept. But at the time, especially in the 1950s, after World War II, major building was happening. The work had to be done fast. So therefore, they just had one set of plans, and if you just have that one set of plans, that's one size fits up. And I can continuously build those. Mass-producing houses. You know, Ford did it with the Model T. Someone else can do it with the house. Okay. We have to rethink that. Okay. I cannot build an Empire State Building in every city. I cannot build a Hoover Dam on every river. Maybe I shouldn't build any of those things. That's a piece of it. around to it. In order to do this, if you do this, and I think if you do this well, this is what I like to say is truly engineering. This is actually being creative. Okay? And working with multiple thought processes out there really forces you to be creative. Forces you to be innovative. Okay? And therefore, you're going to be solving some very complex problems, ones that have vexed engineers and scientists for a number of years now on how do we actually raise up everyone, not just you know, this one city and not just this one area, okay? but raise up everyone by using technology, okay? using the knowledge that we have, okay? and creating new knowledge as well. Okay? And so I am not going to sit here and say that we should stop doing the traditional research that we've been doing for a number of centuries, because no, I can actually see the benefits of doing that, and they are great. What I'm going to say is we should learn how to use that knowledge more wisely. Take advantage of that new knowledge and think in a broader term than just saying one size fits all. Okay. A classic example is I can build a wastewater treatment facility for my house. 
because I have access to all of the tools and all of the materials. I cannot take that same design and take it to Uganda and have them do it for their house. They don't have the same materials and know-how. They just don't have it. Okay, so this becomes my new KISS principle. No advertising. All right, so everyone knows the old one? Keep it simple with the stupid at the end. <laughs> My new principle, if you will, is called knowledge and innovation is equal to sustainable systems. Okay. So what I'm saying here is, is that knowledge is ever expanding. We're learning new stuff every day. And that expansion of knowledge is still on the exponential track. It's still really shooting up. Okay. To the point to where Civil and environmental engineering, and it may just become, oh, we're doing structural engineering, we're doing geotechnical engineering. That's how a degree program is going to actually run with that. Because the knowledge just within that one particular sub-discipline may be that great. Okay. So our knowledge is ever expanding. However, the innovation part is a necessary part. If you want to do good engineering, you really have to be innovative. You have to take the knowledge that you have and say, how can I use it? To me, that is really engineering. Okay. It's not saying that I've done it somewhere this way, and I'm just going to redo it the same way over here. It's actually taking the knowledge that you have, not just the technical, but the knowledge of the community that you're working in, what their needs are, understanding them just as much as you understand how a bridge works, and then making that all come okay. If you do that, you create sustainable, you can create sustainable systems that are required for Earth's continuance. We can't continue to do things that ex basically use up all of our resources, okay? At least all of our available resources. All right, so now, this is what I'm trying to do with this new KISS principle. Put the focus on customizing your solutions. Instead of one size fits all, think about how it's gonna fit in with a particular application, the area, the location, the people, the economics. All of those things need to be thought about, okay? Optimizing the existing resources to resolve the problem. This is where recycling can actually be beneficial. I can find ways to reuse, to repurpose them. I can fit a solution to the various realities that exist, as opposed to forcing my fit into another reality. So I don't think of KISS as a methodology. I think of it as a frame of mind. This is what engineers should have when they walk into a problem and think uniquely, interestingly, deeply about how that problem can be solved. Okay. All right. So, how do we get to this? This is the circle. <laughs> okay. I believe, personally, that service learning is one of those solutions to how we can educate engineers about this. Okay. Because what service learning does is that it takes a pedagogical approach of actually combining service with learning, okay, and applies it in this way to be synergistic. I can look at engineering education and look at societal needs and say, I can figure out ways to do this. And each solution is a unique solution based on what societal needs are. Okay, I'm actually learning about how to apply the knowledge that I gain okay, to that situation. But I can't completely replicate, you know, put it in a copy machine and make another one for another location, because the situation is completely different. Okay. But the motivator behind doing it this way is that societal need. I am finding that students become extremely motivated to learn more and learn ways to use the knowledge that they are gaining if they know that it's going to benefit someone. And that's the service learning part. Okay. So I'm taking problem solving and saying it's just this and it's the only way to do it, saying no, I've got to look at this in a more holistic way. And truly examine more than this. You may find that the one that I built for Austin, Texas would work in Albuquerque, New Mexico. There's a temperature difference. <laughs> <laughs> you may find that the system will work that way, okay? but you did the analysis. You did the holistic approach of finding out that that was going to work. So it shouldn't be predetermined. Oh, yeah, we built one in Austin, we'll build one just like in Albuquerque. Yeah. All right. So now the circle. So now I'm the associate dean at Jonathan Andrews College of Civic Life. Because I so fervently 
believe in service learning that I changed my research direction from looking at the reuse of waste materials and slow, slowly looking at that, to looking at how, from a pedagogical approach and from an efficacy approach, is service learning really great for me. And that's where I got me more and more interested in understanding what is civic engagement. Okay. What is that about? What is that truly about? Because to really develop a system, even in engineering, you really should go talk to the people you're building the system for. And it's not just the builder of the strip mall that you're building it for. It's also the community. It's all the stakeholders. Really talk to them. Really get into the discussion with them. And so the civic life, the College of Civic Life, is part of that. Okay? It has a very strong belief. It's a long belief. So I kind of feel like I have to recite it with my hand over my heart. <laughs> we believe that the task of creating, sustaining, and improving our communities and democratic institutions is not confined to the classroom or the board, the town hall or the town square, the soapbox or the ballot box. We are engaged in civic life. We organize and debate when we serve, when we advocate and act on issues that affect. That's our belief in the Tisch College. Okay. And so our belief is focused on three pillars, education, research, and practice. In terms of education, all students should have the capacity to address difficult social issues by thinking creatively and testing new solutions. That to me is engineering. I know this is not an engineering college. I know that it's built to cut across the entire institution at Tufts University and beyond, to be honest. Uh, to sort of engage our students civically with the communities that they will come in contact with. We have the local host communities that our campuses sit on, <coughs> or they are international. But from an engineering standpoint, that to me is resonated. In terms of our research, we perform research to build a deeper understanding of the practices and policies that foster civic learning and engagement locally, nationally, and globally. To me, that means that if I send a group called Engineers Without Borders out to do something, that they're not, they're, they're like Doctors Without Borders, but they're not being doctors, they're being engineers. Okay? And they're going out and actually helping communities develop ways in which they can enhance their life. Okay? So they, as students, are getting civically involved with another community. Okay? There's also other opportunities like that, Habitat for Humanity, those situations. But our practice, the third one, this is where we engage directly with the communities. Okay? So this is the idea, the belief, and the understanding of what we're trying to do at uh, Tisch College. Okay. I've only been an associate dean for four and a half months. <laughs> okay. I have been involved with this sort of efforts prior to Tisch College being invented being presented. I've been involved with Tisch College ever since its inception. <laughs> Questions? Now how many, uh, well, what percentage of engineers do you think are convinced by the sustainable, you know, the systems approach, the sustainable approach? <laughs> Neil, do you have any? <laughs> it's a great question. It's a great question. Uh, uh, I guess I guess the answer that I could uh, volunteer is that it's picking up steam. Yeah. Uh, here at here at UMass Dartmouth, we're working very very hard to uh, actually create a, a major in environmental science and sustainability, and we're getting lots of pushback. So at the moment, it's the most popular minor on campus, despite that pushback. So engineering, marine sciences. Uh, biology, chemistry, physics, and so forth are all engaged. All these inter all these different disciplines are, are engaged to try to make this happen. Uh, in, in engineering, uh, a really important part of what we do as practitioners is get a professional engineer's license. And as part of the program evaluation, which keeps programs like Tufts and UMass Dartmouth going, is accreditation. And in the accreditation evaluation process, there is more and more emphasis on how does sustainability play a part in your curriculum. It wasn't there six years ago. 
but it is there now because people are waking up to the fact that we are doing a wonderful job of screwing up the planet <laughs> and engineers basically have to help lead the charge to unscrew it. Yeah. And honestly, um, I'm just totally bowled over by what Chris is talking about because he has done a major swerve in his career to be where he is to help society unscrew the mess that we've all made. Does that answer your question? The resistance is still there. Um, where, where is it from? Oh, so um, I'll take my I'll take my own position. So uh, I, I graduated undergraduate at University of Texas at Austin as a civil engineer. I became a civil I got a master's in civil engineering at the University of Texas, geotechnical engineer, strictly geotechnical engineer. Uh, moved to New England at that point. Worked for three years, then went back to school, got a doctorate in civil engineering. Okay? Everyone that I was taught by, everyone that I graduated with, are strictly engineers and are not focused on the bigger pictures. I just began to recognize how it impacted. And I think the real recognition for me was when I was working, when I could see the political aspects of any job just being taken over. But also, when I was doing a job, and you notice that I'm doing it for this owner or for this potential client, but I now can realize the impact it's going to have on the entire region if that project actually goes to be. Okay. That's where the kernel really began for me to be saying, this is, this is actually related to society. I think more and more people are recognizing it. So I give people credit in the engineering field for recognizing it. However, we still do not educate our students to go beyond that. And to me, it's like that's really the next hard egg to be cracked here. Is that it's not only saying that, oh, that's a great idea, it's fantastic. It's that's not only a great idea, that's the way it should be done. That's the way we should be teaching. Okay? Um, train, we're trying to get on a moving train and slow it down. Uh, inertia's going to be there. We're, we're going to keep trying. I, I will admit, some of my compadres in the engineering education field. They, they could have easily gotten disillusioned and left. But they haven't. They, they, they continue to push this. And will continue to push this. So I'm, I'm hoping that not in my generation, not in my lifetime, but the next generation becomes a standard. Yeah. Where would you put it in the engineering curriculum? Would you be revamping existing courses or adding extra courses and making the degree longer? Neither. <laughs> <laughs> Both. <laughs> How about that? So here, here's, here's, here's my design. I think that our engineering curriculum needs to be threaded together. Okay? But the thread itself is one that is an actual service project to a community. Okay. So if I'm talking about geotechnical engineering, I can definitely teach, you know, talk about you know, foundation design and here's going out and doing soil exploration and stuff. But then I can make that connection directly to, and it's for this community. And you can see what their needs are, okay? By going to talk to them. Find out what really they would like to do with this particular site that they have. And when you do that, the connections become natural in a student's way of doing the work. So introduction is necessary, I think, in all aspects. And the best way to thread our curriculum together is to provide that problem statement is to make it so that every piece of the discipline there, therefore every course that's being taught, is actually connected to that particular problem statement. Okay. And by problem statement, I don't necessarily mean, oh, the New Bedford Harbor. Harbor. It could be really broad, like recycling, and attach it that way. I, I don't know if this would be encouraging to you or not, or if you've noticed this, but I'm from UMass Amherst, and it seems like the movement towards sustainability in many areas, academic areas on campus, is coming from the students. That's where the emphasis is coming from, and the administration is trying to catch up. Trying to catch up. Yeah. Uh, I would agree that the students are pushing the desire. Uh, same thing happened with entrepreneurship. Yeah. And that you see students saying, I really want to, you know, while I'm in my four years of learning and educating, I want to come out a millionaire because I <laughs> figured out something and help make it happen. Uh, there's a lot of learning that happens when you get that motivation. I believe that 
service learning is a motivating factor. Uh, the first time that I used service learning in a class, actually the second, third time, but really, the first time, I instantly saw that students were going far beyond what I was teaching them in the course. Because they were saying, I, I'm, I'm doing it with this community. I really need to understand this component. And so they would spend more time trying to figure out something that I never talked about in class. Because they were motivated to want to make that learning happen. And that's when I said, oh, this is, this is it. This is going to work. Okay, now, some people will claim, this is claim that again, oh, no, that's, that's a naturally civic engagement topic area. Who wants to know anything about why fluids flow the way they flow? How can that be something that will be a civic engagement? And I said, then you really haven't thought about it. Because okay? fluid flow actually does impact a lot of things. Okay? Water flow, I got pipes, that can impact a lot of things. <laughs> okay? So I can actually make it so that the problem statement is related to an issue, a real societal issue. That can be a motivator. Yes. I guess you could say I've, I've, been, I've been lucky enough to watch the changes over time um, in not just the students' beliefs and their desires, but also in the industry's desires. So when I look at the construction industry, 15 years ago, green buildings was a bad to me. They said, it costs more, you don't want to do it, and if we're economic, we don't want to do it. And what drove the construction industry to really accept green was their client's desire. Mm -hmm. And as the client said, you know, I can actually make more money in an office building that I build and actually has LEED certification for silver, gold. I can actually charge more for that office building. So you tell me how much it's going to take to get that certification, and I will do the economic analysis. Now, if it failed, those things would have died. They had. And the other aspect of it is, because it didn't fail, people have found ways to actually make lead buildings, make these environmentally certified buildings, at the same cost as if they didn't fail. And therefore, they save money over time, because they're more energy efficient, they're more this. Those are the things to me that turn out to be the drivers from an economic standpoint for those who want to adopt it. Okay? Now, that isn't true for every application. There are some things that I can't make economic argument for. That will, and therefore, you may have to go with the political argument, or the cultural argument, or as they like to say in economics, or not economics, but in the green world, the triple bottom line. So you're saying I got the economic, the environmental, and the political. silo you find uh, fellow academic engineering teachers to be. Are there academic uh, scholarly collaborations? For example, uh, I have a professor on my campus, small liberal arts campus, who does research into the chemical remediation of soil uh, okay. contamination. Yeah. And I, we don't have an engineering school, but we have a, a two, three program in a bigger school. I'm just wondering how much, and I know there's the general chemical engineering out of ACS, but mm -hmm. do you find that your fellow Academic engineers are willing and able to collaborate across this kind of things. To all right, so most of the collaboration that I see is associated with education. Mm -hmm. so that is my, 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 my research side. So there it is, I mean, it's, it's a lot of civil and environmental engineers. Yes, mechanical, chemical and electrical, agricultural people. It's, it's a long long list, but it's all around the edu engineering education. If I was saying, what are you collaborating on from your technical sense? That's less so. 
And those silos still exist. I would actually say that some of those silos are not exactly breaking, but they are reality. <laughs> I'm developing a different silo. My area is only this, which is structural health monitoring. I know structural engineering and all that stuff, but it's only structural health monitoring. Because I have not only look at a structure, but I look at the electronics. Because I have to figure out the sensors that actually will be able to help me monitor this. And I need an understanding of big data. Because these sensors are just cranking out data. On and on and on. So, so that's my area. That's my, that's my side. Now, it does cut across, across disciplinary engineering disciplinary pieces. Okay? So it turns into very unique pieces. It's a reallocation of the silo. And I would like to see that that silo still has uh, that, that silo still exists under a bigger and larger umbrella that is societal needs. That's a, that's a major reason why it's doing this work. Right. The knowledge and the innovations part of the FIS principle should allow for people to reallocate themselves into, from one silo to another if they want to go into the silo thing. I think of it as it'd be great to work on the, the, full, the full spectrum, have some deep knowledge, but also have a broad base of knowledge. And I like to call it the realization is uh, to know what you don't know and to find the people that do know this stuff and will be able to do work in that area. And that's how I've got a lot of my collaborations. I've got a lot of good engineering education people who've been able to work with. Any questions? Comments? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs>